Salute omnes. This is Abbey Latin Liber Primus, Chapter 9. This is a lesson on Chapter 9's morphology, introduction of the imperative mood and the vocative case. We are working with verbs once again when we talk about mood. Mood is a property of a verb. Now, before we said that verbs had three things that they that a verb needs to have in order to be a verb. A verb needs to have person, a verb needs to have number, and the verb needs to have tense. And we defined person as who is doing that action. So a verb needs to be first, second, or third person. You can see here on the chart. Number. That describes how many persons there are doing the action, either singular or plural. And we put these together to first person singular. That means I. I am doing the action. English, the subject pronoun is I. Second person singular, you are doing the action. Thou art doing the action. Third person singular, it's a he, she, or an it. So first person singular is I, if we add someone else, I plus someone else, that equals we. You and someone else makes you or ye or even y'all. And then he, she, it plus someone else, we say they. Now verbs also need tense. Tense is time when the action takes place. And Latin has six well-defined tenses the present tense, imperfect tense, and future tense, then the perfect, pluperfect, and future perfect tenses. Now, new, voice. Now, voice we're gonna get into in a couple chapters, so we're not gonna worry about voice right now. But voice tells us whether the subject is doing the action of the verb or is being acted upon. All you need to know right now is that the voice, the answer for now is going to be active. You have only seen the active voice and you're only gonna see the active voice for the next couple chapters. So don't worry about voice right now. The answer for voice right now is always active. Now mood, that's where we're at this chapter, mood. Mood or mode, that is the reality of the action. That is, how real is the action? Up till now, you have only been introduced to the indicative mood. We're going to be focusing on the imperative mood in this chapter. So the five things that each verb needs to have, person, number, tense, voice, and mood. So for instance, if I were to say, what are the person, number, tense, voice, and mood of Amo? You would look at Amo, I love, and say that it is first person singular, I. Amo is happening in the present time. The voice is going to be active. And it is indicative mood. For Amabat, third person singular, imperfect, active, indicative. And Amaweretis, second person plural, future perfect, active, indicative. Now, new to the game, the imperative mood. So check out these verb forms, ama and amate. So imperatives are going to be second person, either singular or plural. We're only gonna focus on the present tense and the active voice and imperative mood. So let's dive deeper into this. Mood, hopefully you've already watched the mood video but if not, make sure you watch the mood video after you finish this one. So there are three moods in English and Latin has the same three moods. First mood is the indicative mood. That's the mood that we've been working with up till now. All the verbs you've met up till now have been indicative, indicative mood. That shows reality. The indicative indicates reality. What is real? It's a statement of fact. For example, I am writing a letter. I am. It's happening right now. Fact. 
or the negative, I am not writing a letter. In fact, that is true, I'm not writing a letter right now. I am not. So the indicative indicates reality, what is real. Fact, something is happening, something is not happening. Now the imperative, that's the one we're working on this chapter, the imperative shows commands. It comes from the Latin verb impero imperare, which means to command, to order. The imperative shows commands, so we would say write a letter, write being the imperative, the order, the command. And the negative would be don't write a letter. Now the subjunctive you're going to learn much later, that's the unreal potential, wishes, hypothetical, so not indicative. It's not really imperative and it's not indicative. If the indicative shows fact, I am writing a letter, the subjunctive shows potential. What is not fact, but what may be fact, what might happen. I may write a letter. I might. I don't know. It's not actually happening right now. It may happen. It has the potential to happen. The negative, I may not write a letter as opposed to the factual, I am not writing a letter. So we're focusing on the imperative, the imperative mood commands. We know the indicative, that's the one we have been working with up till now. Now we, the imperative joins the party, commands. We can order people about, yes, how very Roman. How do we form the imperative in English? How do we do commands in English? So first, like always, you need to know the principal parts of any English verb. So for example, let's take love. So I want to love, I loved, I have loved. Principal parts, love, loved, and loved. Okay, to make the English imperative mood, that is the command form, that is the bare first, person, first principal part of the verb. So you take the first principal part and don't have anything else. It's gotta be the bare form, so it lacks two. So, love. We can also indicate the imperative by adding an exclamation point. Remember, the Romans did not have exclamation points. So, love. Do it. Command. I command thee. To work. Get rid of the two. Work. Give. Be. Be better. Imperative. Be. That is the imperative of to be. Now, in English, the plural is typically the same as the singular. You were shouting at one person to do something, it would be the same form if you were shouting at more than one person to do something. So if you're shouting at one person, love, it would be the same form for more than one person, love. We can, however, distinguish in writing or also in speaking. It sounds a little bit weird, but we can do this. We can add a thou or a you so put a comma after the imperative, and then this is, is called a vocative direct address. And we're going to talk about that in a minute or two. The plural will be ye. Notice how imperatives are second person. Imperatives are always second person because you're talking to a you, either singular or plural. So if I wanted to tell one person to love, I would say love thou. Plural, love ye. Make sure the comma is there. And of course you indicate the comma when you speak by pausing slightly. Write thou, write ye, would be the plural. Does that sound weird? Of course it does. But you know, if we all do this, we could bring it back. Hear ye, hear ye, you're telling plural people, more than one use, y'all, to hear, listen up. Hear ye, hear ye, a grand proclamation. All right, how do we do this in Latin? It's pretty easy. It's just the present stem. So the imperative singular is just the present stem. You go to the second principal part and you chop off the whoosh, the RE. Now, when you get to your irregular friend, sum esse fui futurus, just chop off the SE, where the RE would be. And it's S. It's kind of regular. So ama, labora, da, S for amo, laboro, do, and sum. So second principal part, chop off the RE. Ama, labora, da, and then the SE for sum to get S. Those are the imperative forms. Love, work, give, be. 
you can add an exclamation mark if you want in order to indicate the imperative. Remember, the Romans didn't have them or use them, but you can. How do you form the plural? Talking to more than one person? Add te. Ama te. Da te. Es te. Singular. Plural. You've actually been introduced to this from the very beginning. Hello, hi, is just salve, which is an imperative of the verb salveo, which means to be well. I'm ordering you, commanding you to be well when I say salve. When I say salvete, like salvete omnes, I'm ordering omnes, all y'all, to salvete, plural imperative, be well. Now, wale and walete, same thing. Be well, fare ye well. What is goodbye or fare ye well, but an imperative to stay cool, stay well, be well. Now, not always, but often, an imperative goes with a vocative, or a vocative goes with an imperative. Not always, but often. Now, what is the vocative? The secret case. It's kind of the secret case. There is a case other than nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and ablative, and that's called the locative. Did I say locative? I meant the vocative. Shh, you didn't hear that part about the locative yet. But the vocative case, check it out. Vocative, wokot, wokot, to call. This is a case that it's well-defined, but because it is the same form very often as the nominative, we didn't really go into it or go over it, but here it is now. The vocative has only one use, only one reason or function, and that is direct address. When someone is being directly called by their name or by their title. So when you call someone, you know, son, daughter, mother, father, when you call someone by their, their name, by their title, by what they are, that's in the vocative case. It's called direct address. Because most, for most nouns, the vocative is the same as the nominative, it, uh, it's, uh, the vocative is usually post-positive. That is, it is placed afterwards. It is rarely the first word in a sentence, probably so that one can distinguish it from the nominative, because the forms are often the same. Notably, however, take note that the vocative does have different endings from the nominative in a couple places. So if you have a second declension masculine noun, like amicus, ends in us, the vocative for such a noun will end in the letter e. So amicus becomes amicae. Legatus would become legate. This is the vocative, amicae. So if you wanted to call your friend, friend, what you doing, friend? What's up, friend? Amike. Amike. Amicus is nominative for when your friend is doing the action. When you want to call your friend, friend. Hey, buddy. Amike. And the plural will be the same as the nominative plural. So, amiki. What's up, friends? Amiki. Mei amiki. If we have a second declension masculine noun that ends in I-U-S, the vocative singular is the letter I. So filius, son, is doing something because the nominative shows the subject. The vocative direct address will be fili. Mi fili, my son. What is up, my son? Mi fili. What's up, son? Fili. And the vocative of meos is mi. So my friend would be mi amike. My son would be mi fili. And here are a few examples. Ambula. So here's an imperative mood. It's singular. So walk. You're ordering one person to walk. And who's that person? Well, you call her by what she is. Girl. Girl. Walk to the farmhouses. Plural. Girls. Walk to the farmhouses. Notice that the vocative is offset by commas, which the Romans did not have, but we will utilize. You should also put this in your writing when you translate. Make sure you offset the vocative by commas. It will help you. Walk, ye girls, to the farmhouses. Pecunia, mi fili, servo da. Money, my son, 
Give to the slave. Give money to the slave, my son. My son, give money to the slave. And then the plural pecunia, mei fili servo date. Give money to the slave, my sons. Notice that the singular imperative becomes plural. Because we're talking to more than one person, more than one you. Ubi es, mi amike, where are you, my friend? Ubi estis, mei amiki, where are you, my friends? Optime, excellent. You are now ready to move on to exercise A, chapter 9. Volete omnis.